Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's study. Uh, you can see Stephen there in the background. He's popping in and out of existence like a virtual particle. <laughs> so but uh, a good trick. Yeah, well, that's that's uh, what happens, I guess, yeah, with uh, this technology. It's, uh... <laughs> anyway, good evening, everyone. Um, happy Sabbath. We're at Sabbath. It's not Sabbath here yet, but. Uh, it won't be long. It will be in a few hours. Um, we want to keep uh, everyone in prayer, this camp meeting coming up in prayer. Um, it's been a real blessing having Stephen here so far, and uh, we've learned a lot. Um, I'm sure we're going to learn more once we get going through these studies. Um, so before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all the things that you have done this past week, the blessings that we have received, the trials that we have faced, uh, the struggles. And Lord, we know that we are in your hands. And um, we pray for Iran as he travels, that you can give him safety, and that his car uh, works well. And uh, we pray for the meetings coming. We pray for Angela her flight on Sunday, and uh, for Dwight and Jenny and others who may be coming. Um, and uh, we just ask, Lord, that uh, the recording of the meetings will go well, that we can get these meetings out to everyone, and uh, that people around the world will be blessed by this uh, concentration of light focused upon uh, what you want us to do. Uh, but for now, Lord, as we open up the message from A.T. Jones, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, that we can see our need, and that the truths that we have been studying, uh, that give us a power and conviction, uh, can be realized as we come close to you. We pray for this movement. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you can move upon the hearts of, of each person who is studying present truth and that you can lead us into all truth. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so Jones, when, last week when we were studying, uh, we had noted that um, uh, Jones wants us to look at the 58th chapter of Isaiah, and he had, he had referenced it in the study. Now, I think I mentioned it was the first scripture song that I had written. So I, I know I wrote um, the first three scripture songs I wrote were Revelation 14, the three angels' messages, uh, Isaiah chapter 58, the first part. Um, later on, I wrote the second part where it talks about, um, you know, they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. That's also in chapter 58. And, um, and then I wrote one called Psalm 126, which ends Psalm 126, like that, you know, that old style of doing the scripture songs where you have the scripture in it. Um, and uh, so I had, those were my first three scripture songs. So, of course, they're all very relevant. Um, and that would have been back in uh, 80, 1984, so a little while ago. <clears throat> But anyway, Jones wants us to look at uh, Isaiah 58, and hopefully some of you have read it, uh, if not recently, at least in the past. So Jones says, um, turn to the 58th chapter of Isaiah, and let us read a portion of that chapter to begin with this evening, as connecting with the close of the lesson we had last night. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. Just as though they were in harmony with all the ordinances of the Lord. Uh, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have ye fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? 
Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Here's the answer. Behold, in the day of your fast, ye you find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? Now, the tes text asks, is it a day for a man to afflict his soul? The margin in the is the better reading. Is it for a man to afflict his soul for a day? A, a man proposes to fast. He goes without victuals, perhaps from breakfast to supper, and afflicts his soul by thus going hungry and calls that a fast. He has afflicted his soul for a day. Is it such a fast that I have chosen for a man to afflict his soul for a day? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? But thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord. Um, now, actually, I disagree with Jones a little bit here. I actually think um, that the reference is uh, this a day for a man to afflict his soul is, is relating to a period of time. That is, uh, the first sermon I ever did um, was called a mel a Milk, Meat, and Fasting. And I looked at the scriptures that dealt with milk desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Um, the one in Isaiah 28, that, you know, uh, where it talks about um, they that are weaned from the breast and drawn from the milk, uh, weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. And then also the one where Paul talks about, uh, um, I, I want to give you meat, but you can only take milk, right? A desire that you would want meat. So, and then I looked at, um, so I looked at meat and Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work. And then I looked at fasting. And of course I used uh, Isaiah 58. And, and the idea is that, you know, there is this, there is a time for milk. There's a time for meat and there's a time to fast. Right. And, and fasting, um, you know, Jesus, well, just going back to, to meat, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish the work, right? That's how he was being fed by doing God's work. But there is a time to fast, right? And Christ, of course, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. So the idea here of a fast, though, is, is self-sacrifice. So this is, this is what they aren't doing they're just doing an outward sort of fast but they're not sacrificing they're not meeting the needs of those around them and so this idea of is this a day to afflict his soul um i think this is some kind of a reference to like the time in which you're in so to just be fasting not eating is that really the day because there's all these different fast days uh, is that really the day that you should be doing that? That's how I understand it. I mean, Jones is probably right to some degree as well, but I just think that the way the King James puts it makes sense to me, but he just gives it a different sort of sense than what uh, Jones does from what I do. Um, <clears throat> so, and so the idea that God has appointed a fast. Uh, so what is the fast that's appointed to us at the present time. I mean, the Day of Atonement, the day of atonement since October 22, 1844, we're in the Day of Atonement and there's a fast involved. Um, I used to work for a, a Jewish guy named David Kadash. He is from Tel Aviv in Israel. And he wasn't a very observant Jew, uh, but he says if he didn't fast on the Day of Atonement, God would strike him dead. So uh, he's a little bit superstitious, I think, in that regard. Um, uh, but, you know, he didn't really observe anything else. He just thought if he fasted on the Day of Atonement, then, you know, he had sort of done his... Due diligence? Yeah, well, his, the, the least of responsibility that he could possibly uh, render to God, least of the service that he would have to do. But um, 
but we know that we're in the day of atonement and this, this fast is not just about not eating. Uh, it's about taking what we have and giving it to others. And especially in regard to God's word. And then, yeah, and it's a day for afflicting our souls. But if we, if we look at what, what um, Isaiah 58 is talking about, I mean, it's talking about our time. And so this is not just a day to afflict your soul in a literal sense, that this is about uh, that final work done at the end of the world. You know, they that shall be of these shall build the old waste places. They shall restore the foundation of many generations, right? And we're supposed to keep our foot from the Sabbath, from doing our pleasure on God's holy day. That's all part of Isaiah chapter 58. It's all part of the same story. But let's go on with what Jones has to say. Um, so he's going to read uh, the verse here. Is not this the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, now here, often this is taken in the sense of, you know, physical needs, but I don't think that's primarily uh, the point here um, because the bread that we are to feed people is God's word and, and those that are cast out are those that, that the world has rejected, right? Those that are seeking to find the truth. Uh, blessed are the poor for they shall what? What's the blessing for the poor in uh, the Sermon on the Mount? They shall be fed. Wait a minute. I think that's something else. <laughs> this, this are the poor in spirit, for they shall see the kingdom of God. Oh, that, <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Okay. Right? So oh, and they'll be fed. They'll think be about fed they're with cast them. out of their house. Oh, sorry about that, Jeff. But you can see how they're cast out of their house. Yeah. They're right. going to be God's kingdom, right? Right. So that's what we are offering people. And basically everyone who isn't in God's kingdom, anybody who doesn't know God, those are the poor. And, and we need to, to bring them up to our house, right? That is to Christ. And when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. So when other people have faults, you know, instead of, you know, pointing out the faults, we need to cover their faults. We need to to help them, right? We don't want to expose people uh, to ridicule and shame, right? And not hide, thy, hide thyself from thine own flesh because those, those are the same flesh that we are, right? We're all one flesh. So anyway, um, Jones goes on. Uh, that is the point at which the lesson closed last night. That is the fast that God has chosen for his people. That is an acceptable fast unto the Lord. But that fast can never be observed until those who would observe it have come to the place where they shall see Jesus Christ allied as he is to every soul on this earth and shall treat him according to the alliance that Christ has made with him. When we reach that place and we reach it in Jesus Christ, for it is there, then that will be the fast that we will observe right along. I have a sentence here that I will read. I found it in a testimony the other day. Search heaven and earth, and there is no truth revealed more powerful than that which is manifested in mercy to the very ones who need your sympathy and aid in breaking the yoke and setting free the oppressed. Here the truth is lived, the truth is obeyed, the truth is taught as it is in Jesus. So then, in manifesting mercy to those who need sympathy, in manifesting aid to, in breaking the yoke and setting free the oppressed, in that, the truth is lived. The truth is obeyed. In that, the truth is taught, as it is in Jesus, assuredly. Does not that bring us right where Jesus is? Is not that Jesus himself? The very thing that we are studying is that Christ has allied himself with every soul on the earth 
He has linked himself with every human being, with everyone in sinful flesh. And we are not to hide ourselves from him who is our flesh. And when we who profess the name of Christ shall respect him in every man with whom he has allied himself, there will be just one grand Christian help band wherever Seventh-day Adventists are found. Then Christian help work will be going on everywhere and all the time for that is Christianity itself. Now here he's talking about a Christian help band. We would call that, what we used to call it like a Dorcas society. I guess now it'd be ADRA. Um, but in, in the Adventist church, we've divorced the, the, the helping of those in need from the giving of the gospel, right? And, and why have we done that? Why has the church chosen to secularize ADRA? How did they... Uh... How did they secularize ADRA? Well, in what, in what way did they? Well, they can't. They can't use ADRA to spread the gospel. They just use it to uh, meet the physical needs of people. I know they aligned with the United Nations, with the UN. I think it. I believe so. Right. Yeah, it has to be, That's it has to be. Yeah, what's Angela? And I'm just going along with what Jeff said because I, I've heard the same thing. Well, it's aligned with the UN. Well, I don't even care if it's aligned with the UN. I, I, I know here in Canada, the, the fact is that in order for the Canadian government to give, so when, when you give money to ADRA, the Canadian government either matches it or adds extra. And in order to get the Canadian government to, to give money, to sort of multiply our money, uh, the church had to make concessions. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to stand out as peculiar people. Big mistake. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, that's horrible. Covetousness and cowardice. Yeah, that's yeah, it's bad. Yeah, I mean, it, it would just, I mean, the government's going to spend money helping the poor in a secular way. The church, in reaching the poor, uh, needs to be ministering the gospel, not just meeting their physical needs. Um, and so, you know, it, it, so Christian help bands, is, as Jones calls them here, I mean, this would be something that's definitely Christian. You're doing this to help people. Or like the Dorcas Society, you're leading people to Christ by first meeting their physical needs, but also not just saying, okay, here's your physical needs. You have spiritual needs as well. But the church has shied away from that when it comes to uh, the work of helping the poor. Uh, anyway, uh, he goes on, uh, that is all the trouble. Why should it be that only a portion of the church should be ready to engage in Christian help work or compose a Christian help band? What is our profession in the world? We profess the name of Christ, which is, which in the nature of things demands that we respect the investment that he has made in every human soul and that we minister to all in need. On the other hand, the organization of Christian help bands or any other kinds of bands to do this thing from the side of mere duty, urging ourselves on to do it and pledging ourselves to do it without seeing Jesus Christ in it. And without this connection, which uh, connection with Christ and this love for him that sees his interests in all human beings and ministers to him as he is linked to all men that will miss it also. Other kinds of Christian work will go along with that, but this is the greatest. Search heaven and earth, and there is no truth revealed more powerful in Christian work and in teaching the truth as it is in Jesus. In heaven and earth, there is nothing like it. Just in this time, when such a fast as that is needed everywhere, and among us especially, how blessed a thing is it that the Lord brings us right to that point and reveals the whole subject to us, giving us the spirit and the secret that will do the whole of it in Christ's name, for his sake, with his spirit, and to do, and to every man, because every soul is the purchase of Christ. Wherever we meet a human being, Christ has allied himself with that man. Whoever he is, the Lord is interested in him. He has invested all that he has in that man. This truth draws us to the point where we shall always be doing everything possible to put forth the attractions of Christ. Uh, the graces of Christ and the goodness of Christ to men 
who know him not, but in whom he has invested all, so they may be drawn uh, to where they too will respect the goodness of Christ and the wondrous investment that he has made in them. If you are doing it for man's sake or for your own credit, you may be taken in, of course. But if you do it as unto Christ, and because of Christ's interest in the man, it is literally impossible for you ever to be taken in for Christ ever liveth and doth not forget. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn, thou, turn not thou away. Here's the principle. It is to Christ that we are doing it. And as stated in the previous lesson, though the man may despise Christ, never believe on him as long as the world lasts, and may sink into perdition at the last, Christ in that great day, when I, when I stand on his right hand yonder, will not have forgotten it. And in remembrance of it, he will then say, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. You remember the place where he says, whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And this being so, when done only in the name of a disciple, how much more when it is done always in the name of the Lord himself? For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Hebrews 6.10. Do you minister? That is the question. This is the true fellowship of man, the true brotherhood of man. A great deal is said nowadays about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. But it is just the brotherhood of such men as they approve all the time. And if you belong to our order, then that is the brotherhood of man. But if you do not, we have nothing to do with you. Even churches also act the same way. If you belong to our church, then that is the brotherhood of man. But if you do not belong to our church, why? We have no particular interest in you as we have nothing to do properly with caring for those who are outside of our church. This is our brotherhood of man. All this is not the brotherhood of man at all. The true fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man is the brotherhood of man in Jesus Christ. It is to see Jesus Christ as he has allied himself to every man. And as he, had, as he has invested all, he has in every man, all he has in every man, which was our flesh. He has broken down the middle wall of partition that was between us. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace indeed. And in him, there's neither Greek nor Jew, black nor white, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, nothing of the kind. All are one in Christ Jesus, and there is no respect of persons with God. In Jesus Christ alone is the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And in Jesus Christ, we find the brotherhood of man only when we find Christ the brother of every man. For it is written, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, not ashamed to call who brethren, everyone that is of flesh and blood. Christ is not ashamed to call him brother. He's not ashamed to go and take him by the hand, even though his breath does smell of liquor and says, come with me and let us go a better way. That is the brotherhood of man. It has been Satan's work always to get men to think that God is far away as possible. But it is the Lord's everlasting effort to get men to find out that he is as near to everyone as possible. So it is written, he is not far from every one of us. The great trouble with heathenism was to think that God was so far away, not only far away, but full of wrath at them all, and, the, and only waiting to get a chance to pick them up and savagely shake them and plunge them into perdition. So viewing him, 
They made offerings to get him in a good humor and to keep him from hurting them. But he was not far from every one of them all the time. Not far, that is, near. So near that all they had to do was to feel after him. Although they were blind and in the dark, too, all they had to do was feel after him and they would find him. Acts 17, 21 to 28. Then the papacy came in. The very incarnation of that enmity between man and God. This arc incarnation of evil entered under the name of Christianity. And it again puts God in Christ so far away that nobody can come near to them. Everybody else comes in before God. Now, of course, um, you know, one of the things we can see, uh, and he's going to talk here about the saints and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, Catholics don't go to Christ generally, directly. They have to go through Mary or some saint. Um, remember once when I lived in the city when I was in my early 20s and uh, pretty bad neighborhood. This is the neighborhood I grew up in. And um, one time out my bedroom window in the back alley, there was a guy screaming at the top of his lungs uh, to all these different saints as uh, he was standing on the roof of a car as the police were gathered around him. Uh, <laughs> trying to, to get him to calm down. He was obviously on some kind of um, drug trip or whatever, um, uh, but he was, he was terribly frightened. It's probably LSD maybe, I don't know. But uh, he was calling out to all these different saints, but he wasn't calling out to Jesus. He was I, I, all kinds of saints I'd never heard of. Uh, so he must've been uh, Catholic. He knew pretty much the whole, uh, um, whatever they call it group of saints. I don't know what they call that. But anyway, men uh, look, uh, the thing about the Catholic Church is first, they have to bring God far away. So they have to make Christ not like us. And then they have to have Mary be this mediator between us and Christ. And so they have to, but, you know, Mary has to be holy in order to give birth to Christ. So she had to be immaculately conceived so she could be the mother of Mary. So Christ is very unlike us. And that's why you have to pray to these saints. Jesus isn't going to hear you because he doesn't, he can't relate to you. You need some saint. Anyway, he's, he's going to touch on this a bit. Then in addition to all this, he is so far away that Mary and her mother and her father, and then all the rest of the Catholic saints, clear down to Joan of Arc and Christopher Columbus pretty soon, all these have to come in between God and men so as to make such a connection that all can be sure that they are noticed by him. Uh, but this is all of Satan's invention. Christ is not so far away as that. He's not far enough away to get a single relation in between him and me or between him and you. And this is just where God wants us to view him. So near that it is impossible for anything or anybody to get between but to how many people has he come so near? He is, not, he is not far away from every one of us, even the heathen. The incarnation of that enmity that is against God and that separates between man and God, uh, the papacy built up this. And now here is this same thought that we mentioned a moment ago. The false idea that he is so holy that it would be entirely unbecoming of him to come near to us and be possessed of such a nature as we have, sinful, depraved, fallen human nature. Therefore, Mary must be born immaculate, perfect, sinless, and higher than the cherubim and seraphim. And then Christ must be so born of her as to take his human nature in an absolute sinlessness, in absolute sinless, sinlessness from her. But that puts him farther away from us than the cherubim and seraphim are and in a sinless nature. But if he comes so no nearer to us than in a sinless nature, that is a long way off because I need somebody that is nearer to me than that. I need someone to help me who knows something about sinful nature, for that is the nature that I have. And such the Lord did take. He became one of us. Thus, you see, 
This is present truth in every respect. Now that the papacy has taken possession of the world and the image of it is going on in the wrong way, forgetting all, um, all that God is in Jesus Christ and all that Christ is in the world, having the form of godliness without the reality, without the power. In this day, is it not just the thing that is needed in the world? That God should proclaim the real merits of Jesus Christ once more and his holiness? It is true, he is holy. He is altogether holy. But his holiness is not that kind that makes him afraid to be in company with people who are not holy for fear he will get his holiness spoiled. Anybody who has such a kind of holiness that they cannot be found in the company in, in the name of Jesus Christ, of people who are fallen and lost and degraded without spoiling it, uh, would better get rid of it as quickly as possible and get the right kind. Because that kind of holiness is not worth having. It is already spoiled. Question. What about the reputation? The Christian has no reputation. He has character. The Christian asks no questions about reputation. Character. Character is all that the Christian cares for, and that the character of God revealed in Jesus Christ. And of course, we understand that question because what, what's behind that question is, well, I don't want to hang around with people because I'm hanging around with the wrong type of people. Maybe people are going to think the wrong thing about me and you know, think that I'm like they are. And um, so they're going to put their nose down at me, uh, look down their nose at me. Um, I think that's what's behind that question. But if you think about it, as Christians, uh, our reputations are constantly attacked. But they can't do anything about our character. That's the only thing that we have. So even though our reputations are trashed and dragged in the mud, um, if we have the character of Christ, that is what is going to draw people to Christ. If we had a good reputation, but we didn't have a character of Christ, uh, it would draw worldly people, but it wouldn't draw people like worldly people to us, but it wouldn't draw people who want to leave the world and join with Christ. <clears throat> but there is a great amount of just that kind of holiness among professed Christians in these days. Indeed, I'm not sure that this is, that is all outside of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. It is that kind of holiness which leads many to be ready to exclaim if a brother or sister, a sister especially, should go among the fallen, unfortunate ones, and begin to work for them and sympathize with them and help them. Oh, well, if you're going with such people as that, I cannot associate with you anymore. Indeed, I'm not going, I'm not sure that I want to belong to the church anymore if you're going to work for such people and bring them into the church. The answer to all such expressions as those is very good. If you do not want to belong to the church with such people as that, you would better go get out of the church as quickly as possible. Very soon, the church of Jesus Christ is going to have just that kind of people in it. The publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. The church of Jesus Christ in a little while is going to be so molded upon the grace of Jesus Christ and so filled with his holy character, that its members will not be afraid to go, as did he, to the lowest depths to pick up the fallen. They will have such measure of the holiness of Jesus Christ that they will not be afraid of becoming defiled by going in his name down to the lowest. But that kind of holiness which says, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou, stand aloof, or you will defile my holy garments. Oh, that is the holiness of the devil. Away with it. God's holiness is pure. That is true. It is such holiness that sin cannot bear the presence of it. It is holiness of such transcendent purity and power as to be a consuming fire to sin. Its consuming power upon sin is because of its wondrous purity. And therefore, because of the wondrous purity and the power of that wondrous purity in the holiness of God in Jesus Christ, 
He longs to come in contact with those who are laden with sins, who are permeated through and through with sins in order that his holiness, finding an entrance, shall consume the sin and save the soul. And that is Christ's holiness. It is one of the most blessed truths in the Bible that our God is a consuming fire because of his holiness. For then in Jesus Christ, we meet him whose holiness is a consuming fire to sin. And that is the pledge of our salvation in perfection from every stain of sin. The brightness, the glory, the all-consuming purity of that holiness will take every vestige of sin and sinfulness out of the man who will meet God in Jesus Christ. Now, just to comment on this, um, you remember back uh, May 13th, my, my sister-in-law uh, passed away 11,900 days after my brother, who she was married to, had died. And uh, the last time I saw Angela, my sister-in-law, um, we talked a bit about uh, my brother, David, and um, she never did really recover from his death. Um, she sort of, it's always as if he, you know, had just died anytime you would talk to her. She talked about him all the time to everybody. Um, but um, I remember going with her and my brother, Dave. Um, they would go and visit. My brother, Dave, always visited uh, the worst kind of people. He, he was always friends with the worst kind of people. And he would just talk to them about God, read the Bible to them and pray. And, and they would listen to him. You know, drug addicts, alcoholics, uh, prostitutes, just what we call the worst kind of people. Now, I don't know how many people he saved, you know, how many people he got to go to church, how many people were baptized because of him. But that's how he ministered to people. And it did affect me uh, going with him to do these visits of people that he met. Sometimes it'd be people he met on the streets and he'd find out all about them and where they lived and, and their story. And he would listen to their story. I remember we visited a, a guy who was a, a, what they call a deportee. He was deported from um, Romania. I guess he was from Romania. So there was some kind of revolution in Romania. So this was back in the 1970s. Um, and uh, so, you know, we visited him and we listened to his story. And, you know, my brother Dave read to him the Bible and prayed with him. And I never saw him again, you know, so I don't know what happened to him. But those are the type of people that my brother would try to reach. And, and, I asked him about it one time and he says, well, those are the reachable people, but the people who think they have it all together, um, that their life is okay, that nothing bad has happened to them. And, and uh, uh, he says, they're not really reachable. So that's why he would minister them. And it definitely did affect Angela. Angela talked about it and just how always amazed she was that he could just do this. But, you know, this is, for different people, there are different ministries. Um, but we have to be able to come near people who are ill, who, who are sinners, who are destitute. And if we somehow think, well, I don't want to be around that person because you know, they smell bad or whatever it is, um, or our reputations might be damaged, uh, we definitely don't have the spirit of Christ. And to know how to minister to people, it's, it's a gift of God. It's not something that we can just do apart from Christ, at least not in a powerful way. And that's what Joan's talking about. So anyway, Jones goes on. Thus, in his true holiness, Christ could come and did come to sinful men in sinful flesh where sinful men are. Thus, in Christ and in Christ alone is found the brotherhood of man. All indeed are one in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Some have found, and all may find in the testimonies, the statement that Christ has not like passions as we have. The statement is there. Everyone may find it there, of course. Now, we, we did talk about this, and, and, jo and I told you Jones was going to talk about it. Just hang on. Now, there will be no difficulty 
in any of these studies from beginning to end. If you stick precisely to what is said, and not go beyond what is said, nor put it, put into it what is not said, whether it be touching the church and state, separation from the world, or this of Christ in our flesh. Stick strictly to what is said. Do not go to drawing curious conclusions. Some have drawn the conclusion some time ago, and you can see what a fearful conclusion it is, that Christ became ourselves, he is our flesh, therefore I am Christ. And they say, Christ forgave sins, I can forgive sins. He wrought miracles, I must work miracles. That is a fearful argument. There are no two ways about it. Christ became ourselves in our place, weak as we, and in all points like as we are, in order that he might be that forever and never that we should be himself. No. It is God who is to be manifested always and not ourselves. In order that this might be, Christ emptied himself and took ourselves in order that God himself might come to us, appear in us, and be revealed in us and through us in all things. It is always God and never ourselves. That which is ruined us, that which ruined us at the start was the exaltation of ourselves. The setting forth of ourselves and the putting of ourselves above God in order that we might get rid of our wicked selves. Christ emptied his righteous self and stood in the place of our wicked selves and crucified ourselves, putting ourselves underfoot always in order that God might be all in all. How much? All. All in how many? All. It was done that God might be all that there is in me and all that there is in you and all that there is in Christ. Assuredly, that is what this was done for. We are not to exalt ourselves. Christ is in, to increase. I am to decrease. He is to live. I am to die. He is to be exalted. I am to be emptied. <clears throat> and of course, he's going to deal with like passions in the next uh, section, sort of from the other perspective. Um. Now I know this is uh, this one went fairly quick. It seems to be a bit shorter one of Jones, but we've had a hard week. But is is there any thoughts before we close with prayer? Any points that people would like to bring out? Any questions? I mean, Jones. Well, that was awful quick. Yeah, well, I know. Now Jones doesn't leave any stones unturned. Right. He he examines things. And in the next one, uh, when he deals with Christ not having like passions, uh, he's going to show uh, the other side of that. So there's there's the group that says, well, you know, if Christ is now in me, we get holy flesh. Right. We get that idea that somehow I am Christ. Right. That, that's really what he's talking about. He's, he's sort of showing it in an extreme language. But people get this idea, well, you know, I'm not even tempted anymore. But um, uh, there's a way in which people uh, also just reject if, if, he, if he doesn't have like passions as us, right? Right, so you can have holy flesh, but then you have this other one that obviously he's not like us, right? And so he's gonna talk about um, uh, the mind, right? So this is the one, this is the one that I, remember the most right don't drag his mind into it and this is the thing that parminder uh, didn't want us to address because parminder was trying to minimize sin by giving us a nature that's not actually a sinful nature he just wanted us to have a sinful body so so parminder was going to a type of holy flesh and you know, I've, I've made the statement before, but um, um, and just bringing up my brother Dave again as an example. My brother Dave was a perfectionist. And I remember building his house and we, <clears throat> he didn't have a like, a, you know, a power saw. He used a chainsaw. And, you know, we had to cut these, uh, you know, make the rafters and, and uh, 
and for the A-frame because he built an A-frame on top of two octagon floors. But anyway, he had done this cut and it was perfect, you know? And I was amazed that, you know, you could cut a perfect cut with a chainsaw. And I said, and he said, he said, good enough. I said, what are you saying good enough? I said, it's perfect. He says, that's what I mean. Good enough. Perfect is good enough. Um, of course, he was being a little bit facetious, but it was it was partly true in how he looked at things. But um, so I had this little idea that, you know, I'm a perfectionist. I just have a lower standard than my brother did. And but in a sense, that's when when it comes to the idea of righteousness, what we do is we lower the standard so that we can meet it. And so often we look at people as being, you know, he's a perfectionist as that they have a high standard. And I'm not a perfectionist. I'm not a legalist because I don't have as a high standard. You know, I just do my best and Christ does the rest. Uh, but the reality is that person is also a legalist or a perfectionist. Because if there's any standard that we think that we have to meet or that we can meet, it may be the standard of the righteousness of Christ, and we think that we're it, right? Because we don't know what Christ's righteousness is. But if we have some kind of standard, we are a legalist. That is, we're approaching God based upon our performance has to meet some criteria. It could be a lower criteria, um, but it's still a criteria that we have to come to. But when it comes to what Christ wants for us, it's higher, higher than, higher than the human highest. How's it go? Higher than the human. How's this statement go? Higher than the human highest human thought can reach. Is Christ ideal for his people or something like that? Can't remember the, the word. But the idea is that he has um, a standard that even our thoughts cannot attain to. And if we can't even think of that standard, then we can't attain to it except in Christ. And that means in reality, because we've talked about that in Christ, the in Christ motif has been distorted within Adventism to mean it's all done in Christ. He doesn't have to do anything in me. But Jones has shown it's not just in Christ, it's Christ in us, right? So Christ became us. You know, he, he lived his perfect life of righteousness in our nature so that we could attain to something that it is impossible for man to attain to, righteousness. Can I, can I ask you a question, Theodore? Uh, yep. You, you said that people say that they can't be tempted no more. If somebody can't be tempted no more, wouldn't that be like, wouldn't that be like saying that you're on Satan's side? <laughs> oh, well, and I've used this illustration it's like before. You've arrived. Well, yeah, but I mean, remember the story I told about uh, the Light Bears camp meeting back in whatever it was, 88. Um, I think it was 1988 or 87, maybe it was 87. Um, and there was uh, John Whitcomb. He had been with a group called Life Supports, and he was teaching that he hadn't sinned since March or whatever. And this was like in May or June. Um, and you know, it was all based on supposedly J Jones and Wagner, right? They were professing to believe in Jones and Wagner, but I'd read enough of Jones to know that um, if you see yourself as righteous, um, that you're just under a deception. But it was interesting during that entire camp meeting that, that living the Christian life was really, really easy. It was very tempting to believe that I was righteous. I, Satan just withdrew all of his attacks and just let me have a really easy time of it, that at least from my perspective, my human perspective, that, you know, so that I might side with this guy about the fact that I was righteous. But I knew that that was just a dece deception that Satan was bringing, you know, that I don't look for righteousness in myself. But so if somebody says Satan doesn't tempt me anymore, uh, they're just under a deception, right? So that's what you're trying to say, you know, they're, the They're really on Satan's side because Satan isn't tempting them anymore. Satan. Right? Yeah, that's right. Because if you ain't being tempted, I mean, 
there's something wrong there and something that you that that I mean to me to me it's you would be you would be like he was um on his side. I mean yeah. I don't I wouldn't of course I you're right. I'm just well and, and see the sometimes what people focus on is they focus on um like let's say you were an alcoholic and, and God miraculously cured you of alcoholism, you know, and and you have no desire to drink alcohol. And you could maybe say, I'm never tempted to drink alcohol, right? God gave me a victory in that area. So we'll pick something else. But it doesn't mean you can say, well, because I don't drink alcohol, I'm perfect. I mean, there's things in ourselves that we need to see that we haven't seen, right? And so the closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes because the Satan's are the, the deceptions of Satan are, are, are revealed, right? The, the light shines in the darkness and we can see things in ourselves that we never imagined deep in the deep recesses of our heart. And that's why God brings us through trials. He wants us to depend upon him, not upon ourselves. So, um, so this next one is, is one of my favorite in this series, that number 17. Okay. But anyway, we've, we've had a long week and we got, a, we have of course tomorrow study at seven 30 in the morning. We don't have one Sunday, right? Because Sunday is, um, uh, you know, that would be for the morning studies, but we're starting Monday morning and I'm going to send out an email just to clarify all the schedule. I sort of partly have already. Um, but so I'm going to do that again and make sure people know uh, who want to go online and follow the meetings. Of course, they'll still be on YouTube. So if you don't happen to catch it live, you can watch it on YouTube. And the notes we worked on hard, me and me and Stephen all week. Uh, Rand has very good notes. Uh, Dwight has an outline, but I'm sure he's going to have material that we can print out. And so... Um, so some of that stuff we'll get in PDF form and get it out to people, maybe as the meetings go along. But uh, everybody needs your prayers. And uh, um, we're looking forward to what God wants to show us, even if it's only going to be our need of him. So anyway, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the Sabbath, for the rest that we can have, for the fellowship. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you can help us to minister to those around us, that we can see the need. We know it's not just the people who um, appear to be uh, needy. We know there's needs everywhere, even amongst the rich. Um, they just may not be as aware of it. But we pray, Lord, that as we reveal your character to others, they'll be drawn to you, that the presence of holiness, your holiness in our lives will bring a conviction and that uh, your presence will come and consume the sin uh, in us and others. Uh, we pray for Iran, that you can give him a safe trip, that he'll be here soon. And um, we pray that you can bless his family while he's away. And, um, and the sacrifice that all have made to come uh, to this camp meeting to present and to share. And we pray, Lord, that the blessing uh, will be poured out upon each one of us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. And we pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.